I get asked a lot what the difference between my work is and uh, typical Pentagon long-range strategic planners. And the answer I like to offer is what they typically do is they think about the future of war within the context of war. And what I've spent 15 years doing in this business, and it's taken me almost 14 to figure it out, is I think about the future of war within the context of everything else. So I tend to specialize on the scene between war and peace. The material I'm going to show you is one idea from a book with a lot of ideas. It's the one that takes me around the world right now, interacting with foreign militaries quite a bit. Uh, the material was generated in two years of work I did for the Secretary of Defense, thinking about a new national grand strategy for the United States. I'm going to present a problem, try to give you an answer. Here's my favorite bonehead concept from the 1990s in the Pentagon, the theory of anti-access, area denial, asymmetrical strategies. Why do we call it that? Because it's got all those A's lined up, I guess. This is gobbledygook for, if the United States fights somebody, we're going to be huge, they're going to be small, and if they try to fight us in a traditional straight up manner, we're going to kick their ass. Which is why people don't try to do that anymore. I met the last Air Force general who had actually shot down an enemy plane in combat. He's now a one-star general. That's how distant we are from even meeting an Air Force willing to fly against ours. So that overmatched capability creates problems, catastrophic successes, the White House calls them. And we're trying to figure that out. Because it is an amazing capability. And the question is, what's the good you can do with it? Okay? Theory of anti-axis area, area denial asymmetrical strategies. Gobbledygook that we sell to Congress. Because if we just told them we can kick anybody's asses, they wouldn't buy us all the stuff we want. So we say area denial, anti-axis, asymmetrical strategies, and their eyes glaze over. <laughs> and they say, will you build it in my district? <laughs> Here's my parody, and it ain't much of one. Let's talk about a battle space. I don't know, Taiwan Straits, 2025. Let's talk about an enemy embedded within that battle space. I don't know, the Million Man Swim. The United States has to access that battle space instantaneously. They throw up anti-access area denial asymmetrical strategies. A banana peel on the tarmac. <laughs> Trojan horses in our computer networks reveal all our Achilles heels instantly. We say, China, it's yours. Problem with this approach, largely a geographic definition, focus almost exclusively on the start of conflict. We feel the first half team in a league that insists on keeping score until the end of the game. That's the problem. We can run the score up against anybody and then get our asses kicked in the second half. What they call fourth generation warfare. Here's the way I like to describe it instead. There is no battle space the US military cannot access. They said we couldn't do Afghanistan, we did it with ease. They said we couldn't do Iraq. We did it with 150 combat casualties in six weeks. We did it so fast, we weren't prepared for their collapse. There is nobody we can't take down. The question is, what do you do with the power? So there's no trouble accessing battle spaces. What we have trouble accessing is the transition space that must naturally follow and creating the peace space that allows us to move on. Problem is, Defense Department over here beats the hell out of you. State Department over here says, come on boy, I know you can make it. And that poor country runs off that ledge, does that cartoon thing, and then drops. This is not about overwhelming force, but proportional force, about non-lethal technologies. Because if you fire real ammo into a crowd of women and children rioting, you're going to lose friends very quickly. This is not about projecting power, but about staying power, which is about legitimacy with the locals. Who do you access in this transition space? You have to create internal partners, you have to access coalition partners. We asked the Indians for 17,000 peacekeepers. I know their senior leadership, they wanted to give it to us. But they said to us, you know what, in that transition space, you're mostly hat, not enough cattle. We don't think you can pull it off. We're not going to give you our 17,000 peacekeepers for fodder. We asked the Russians for 40,000. They said no. I was in China in August. I said, you should have 50,000 peacekeepers in Iraq. It's your oil, not ours, which is the truth. It's their oil. And the Chinese said to me, Dr. Barnett, you're absolutely right. In a perfect world, we'd have 50,000 there. But it's not a perfect world. And your administration isn't getting us any closer. What we have trouble accessing are outcomes. 
We lucked out, frankly, on this election. We face different opponents across these three. And it's time to start admitting you can't ask the same 19-year-old to do it all, day in and day out. It's just too damn hard. We have an unparalleled capacity to wage war. We don't do the everything else so well. Frankly, we do it better than anybody and we still suck at it. We have a brilliant Secretary of War. We don't have a Secretary of Everything Else. Because if we did, that guy would be in front of the Senate still testifying over Abu Ghraib. Problem is, he doesn't exist. There is no Secretary of Everything Else. I think we have an unparalleled capacity to wage war. I call that the Leviathan Force. What we need to build is a force for the everything else. I call them the system administrators. What I think this really represents is the lack of an A to Z rule set for the world as a whole for processing politically bankrupt states. We have one for processing economically bankrupt states. It's the IMF sovereign bankruptcy plan. Okay? We argue about it every time we use it. Argentina just went through it, broke a lot of rules. They got out on the far end. We said, fine, don't worry about it. It's transparent, certain amount of certainty, gives a sense of a non-zero outcome. We don't have one for processing politically bankrupt states that frankly everybody wants gone. Like Saddam, like Mugabe, like Kim Jong-il. People who kill in the hundreds of thousands or millions, like the 250,000 dead so far in Sudan. What would an A to Z system look like? I'm going to distinguish between what I call front half and back half. And let's call this red line, I don't know, mission accomplished. <laughs> what we have extant right now at the beginning of the system is the UN Security Council as a grand jury. What can they do? They can indict your ass. They can debate it, they can write it on a piece of paper, they can put it in an envelope, mail it to you, and then say in no uncertain terms, please cut that out. <laughs> That gets you about 4 million dead in Central Africa over the 1990s. It gets you 250,000 dead in the Sudan in the last 15 months. Everybody's going to answer their grandchildren someday what you did about the Holocaust in Africa. And you better have an answer. We don't have anything to translate that will into action. What we do have is a U.S. enabled Leviathan force that says, you want me to take that guy down? I'll take that guy down. I'll do it on Tuesday. It'll cost you $20 billion. But here's the deal. As soon as I can't find anybody else to air out, I leave the scene immediately. That's called the Powell Doctrine. Way downstream, we have the International Criminal Court. They love to put them on trial. They got Milosevic right now. What are we missing? A functioning executive translate will into action. Because we don't have it, every time we lead one of these efforts, we have to whip ourselves into this imminent threat thing. We haven't faced an imminent threat since the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. But we use this language from a bygone era to scare ourselves into doing something because we're a democracy and that's what it takes. And if that doesn't work, we scream, he's got a gun, just as we rush in. <laughs> and then we look over the body and we find like an old cigarette lighter and we say, well, Jesus, it was dark. <laughs> you want to do it, France? France says, no. But I do like to criticize you after the fact. <laughs> what we need downstream is a great power enabled, what I call that sysadmin force. We should have had 250,000 troops streaming into Iraq on the heels of that Leviathan sweeping towards Baghdad. What do you get then? No looting, no military disappearing, no arms disappearing, no ammo disappearing, no Maktada al-Sadr making his bones, no insurgency. Talk to anybody who was over there in the first six months. We had six months to feel the love, to get the job done, and we dicked around for six months, and then they turned on us. Why? Because they just got fed up. They saw what we did to Saddam, and they said, you're that powerful, you can resurrect this country, you're America. What we need is an international reconstruction fund, Sebastian Malaby, Washington Post, great idea, modeled on the IMF, instead of passing a hat each time, okay? Where are you going to find this guy? G20, that's easy. Check out their agendas since 9-11, all security dominated. They're going to decide up front how the money gets spent, just like in the IMF. You vote according to how much money you put in the kitty. Here's my challenge to the Defense Department. You've got to build this force, you've got to seed this force, you've got to track coalition partners, create a record of success, you will get this model. You'll tell me it's too hard to do. I'll walk this dog 
right through that six-part series on the Balkans. We did it just like that. I'm talking about regularizing it, making it transparent.